Tonight, what I want to do is I, I want to talk to you just briefly about um, how you and I can mature in our prayer life. The title of the message is this, God wants to change the way you pray. God wants to change how you and I pray. You know, I've been thinking the, the command of Jesus to us is very, very simple, what he wants Christians' lives to look like. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8, here's what he said to the disciples beginning in verse 7. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. So everywhere you and I go, we need to be telling people about Jesus. We need to be telling them that the, that the end time is near, that the, the kingdom is near. And then heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons... Freely you've received, freely give. I mean, this is, when you think of that and you think of doing that, what Jesus is telling us here is this. You cannot give what you do not have. If we're going to see God work through us, we have to allow God to work in us. If we're going to see God do something, and, and the key is not just what he does in the church, because again, thank God for what happens in the church, but if it stays in the church, it will die in the church. The key to all of this is that you and I would have our faith built by what we see in this, if you will, laboratory, and we would take it out and in faith and in confidence and in an anointing. Tell people outside the four walls about Jesus, lay hands on them, and see them healed in Jesus' name. But in order to give that to people, you have to have it in you to give it out. If we try to make something flow out of us and happen externally, if it's not already happened in our heart, then what we have really is religion without power. And we'll find ourselves operating in the flesh, trying to make things happen, but not having the power to do that. And then you're relying on emotionalism. You're relying on trying to work things, trying to create things. And God wants us to naturally, in a supernatural way, minister to people around us. And our ability to function in kingdom power is directly related to our relationship with the king. And that relationship and that power and that grace and that anointing and having something to give is nurtured by how we pray. The way you and I approach the throne of grace, the way you and I spend time with the Lord. If we want to have something to give, we have to receive from the Lord and that comes through prayer. So what I want to do is just quickly, this is not going to take a long time because I really want us to pray. I want to give you three ways we can have our heart filled with his presence, his power, his plan. Um, it's, it's not rocket science in some ways, but it's a good reminder in every other way. Number one, if, if we're going to have a heart filled with his presence, that happens when we slow down and sit at his feet. So there has to be time that you and I spend with the Lord. Hey, praise God, you're in the prayer meeting but this shouldn't be the totality of your prayer life. And praise God that you pray as you're driving to work and that you pray as you're driving home or you pray as you're doing what you do during the day. Every, every believer should do that. We should pray without ceasing. There's a place for that. But if we want him to pour into us so we have something to pour out to others, it requires a ceasing of activity so we can pray. Quieting our heart, quieting our mind, taking time. If your prayer time is only while you're doing something else, it's doubtful you'll have great power on your life. Because the problem will be, you're not going to be able to hear his voice because you're distracted. All of us need to have a place, a time, where we stop everything else and we wait on the Lord. 
a place that removes as many distractions as possible. If your phone distracts you, don't take it with you into your prayer time. If something else distracts you, go somewhere else. Get, a, get in a closet, shut the door. It'll be dark. You will not be very distracted. Do what you have to do to be alone with the Lord. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 38, a story very familiar to us is Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. I mean, she's telling Jesus what to do. Here's what happens if our life is caught up in busyness, and sometimes that busyness can be even serving the Lord. Better for you and I to minister, you know, from having been with him than ministering for him. You know, what's interesting here is Martha's doing things Jesus didn't ask her to do. We know that because he says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. We can assume Jesus never asked her to prepare a meal. She assumed that's what Jesus wanted her to do. Why? Because she hadn't sat in his presence. We can find ourselves doing things that may have some good to them, and may be kind outwardly, but if they're not the things Jesus has asked us to do, and they come at the expense of sitting at his feet, it'd be better if we did not do them. He says, only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Mary sought to please Jesus by being with Jesus, and Jesus loved it. Martha tried to please him through service, but working from his presence is always better than working for his presence. So what I'm asking you to do is to think in terms of waiting on the Lord and spending time with him and having, if you'll do that, you will be surprised how it will revolutionize your walk with God. Our hearts are filled with his presence, his power, and his plan when we slow down and sit at his feet. Second, our hearts are filled with his power and his presence when our spirit hears his voice. What's really important is, as we're communing with the Lord, prayer is a two-way conversation. So we're talking to God, and God is speaking to us. As we commune with him, we'll hear his voice, and we'll begin to understand his desires and what happens. And this is, this is one of the miraculous things that happens in prayer as you and I are in the presence of the Lord and we're listening to his voice, what happens is the things he desires become a part of what we desire. And when we desire what he desires, that's the beginning of a very powerful prayer life. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 24, and I'm going to read this from the King James Version. The reason why is because this, this particular verse is most accurately translated by the King James. None of the other versions uh, give it the treatment that, that this does, that the King James does. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when you pray. What this is saying is when you and I pray, there are desires that are placed in our heart. If you're not quiet with the Lord and you're not taking time with the Lord, you're not going to hear his voice and it's going to be difficult for you to, to have his desires become your desires. But when you quiet, when we quiet our heart with the Lord, then what happens is we begin to hear his voice, his desires begin to become our desires and when that happens, you can believe that you receive them and you will have them. So what we have to do in prayer is a, a prayer at a higher level has got to move beyond just the things that are our laundry list of requests. Lord, I need you to do this. 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 And I need you to do this. Thank you. I love you. Amen. Goodbye. 
If that's the sum of your prayer life, if that's the way it rolls for you, is just telling God what you need and it's about the things you want him to do for you, then your prayer life will lack power and you'll become bored with it. Honestly, and I've said it before, if, if you treated your friends like you're, you treat God in prayer, would, you, would they still be your friends? Because prayer, prayer is, yes, it's going to God, but while we're going to him, we need to listen to him, and God places things in our heart through prayer that then we pray into existence. I think a lot of, uh, a lot of times the problem for people is being able to quiet their internal voice and their thoughts. And I think one of the things that helps us dial down, so I mean, this is not a fancy sermon. Let me just say that. I, mean, I get that. But it's a very practical thing that I think could really help. If you could get a hold of just these three things, it could be revolutionary in your prayer life. One of the things that helps us dial down all our thoughts and our own internal voice is when you and I pray in the Spirit. This is one of the great values of being filled with the Holy Spirit and having a prayer language. It's one of the reasons why every believer needs it. It's why every believer should seek it. Anybody, and again, I, I say this in kindness, but if your attitude is, you know what, if God wants to do that for me, fine, then I would venture to say you're probably not going to ever be filled with the Spirit. If we're casual regarding the things in our attitude, regarding the things God wants to do in our life, it's doubtful we'll see him do them. The strong take it by force. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. They'll be filled. So there's a place for you and I to really value the things God wants us to have that will help us. When a person prays in the Spirit, he, he talks to God, 1 Corinthians 14. Uniquely. When a person prays in the Spirit, he edifies himself. He builds up himself. You say, well, that's, that can be a very self-serving thing. Listen, how many of us know that in our prayer time, we need the Lord to build us up and strengthen us? And I, and I love that idea of building up, that edifies. Uh, it's like God is building in us his purpose, his plan, as I'm praying in the Spirit. But I think as well, one of the great things about praying in the Spirit is this. In verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 14, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Praying in tongues can help us to overcome the distraction of our thoughts, become aware of his presence, and hear his voice. And what happens is when you and I are praying in our prayer language, we're bypassing our intellect which immediately sensitizes our spirit to his spirit. And I believe activates faith in our heart. Listen, faith doesn't come from your mind. Nobody will ever think themselves into great faith. Faith springs from the heart. It's a lot like courage. Nobody thinks themselves into courage. Courage comes out of the heart. In fact, the very word courage means more heart. So if you and I want faith, it comes out of our heart, out of our spirit. And as I pray in the spirit, it sensitizes my spirit to the purposes of God and activates my faith. Honestly, if I want to speak supernaturally to you, it helps me if I speak supernaturally to God. If you want to talk supernaturally to your neighbor or in a situation you're going to, it will help you if you'll pray supernaturally to God. It will activate your faith. It will take your mind and the distractions of your mind out of that setting and activate your spirit. Now, let me say this. That's not to say that's all you do. It's a part of prayer. It should not be all of prayer. Paul says, I'm going to do both. So what will I do? I'll pray with my spirit and I'll pray with my understanding. There is a place for us to pray with our understanding. I'm just simply saying our hearts are filled with his presence, his power, and his plan when our spirit hears his voice. Let me give you one more thing. 
Our hearts are filled with his presence, his power, and his plan when his plan becomes more important than our needs. Now, let me, let me say this. God is not bothered by you and I seeking what we need, but that shouldn't be the majority of our prayer time. When, when you look at the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trust. Lead us not into evil, but deliver us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do you see this? There's this idea of the community. You're praying. You're praying not just for yourself. You're praying for others. And honestly, all of that prayer involves a prayer for others. That also can include us, but if our prayer time, if your prayer time focuses on you, your prayer time will be boring and dead. And this is why some people have trouble praying, because they only pray about themselves, and after a while, there's only so much to pray about. But when you start realizing that through prayer, God is speaking to you, and you let his desires become your desires, and you begin to hear his voice, and he begins to direct you concerning other people, and he puts people on your heart, situations on your heart, circumstances on your heart, and you begin to sense what he's doing, then the, the fact of the matter is you will not have enough time to get it all in. you find your prayer time going like that. God wants our prayer life to be about his concerns. I mean, and you say, well, what about my needs? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. What you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to do, all the physical things of life which consumes most people's praying. God says, I'll make a deal with you. I'll take care of all that. You take care of my business. I'll take care of yours. And I can promise you he'll do a better job with your business than you will. And the beautiful thing is you can trust him to take care of those things. Again, what I'm calling for, I'm not, I'm not trying to be harsh on anybody. I'm trying to encourage you to mature in your understanding of prayer and how it should work in your life. Are you with me on that? Asking God to swoop down and fix the problems of our life does not take the kind of faith God is looking for from you or wants expressed in you. In fact, desperation is not always an expression of faith. There are a lot of people who, when they're in trouble, cry out to God. That does not mean they have faith. Here's an interesting story. I, I just think this is such an interesting event in, in the Gospels. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him, that's Jesus, along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. And a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? I mean, that's like the dumbest question in the world, right? You know, when, you, when you're all worked up, when you're thinking about yourself, you're not thinking clearly. They're not thinking clearly at all. He got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? What's, what's God looking for? You say, they cried out to God and said, Jesus, save us, help us. But that was not a faithful prayer. What God was wanting was God was wanting them to have the kind of prayer that would pray his will into existence. The kind of faith that would pray his, his will into existence. And what was his will in this situation? What's the will of God here? For the storm to stop. That's, that's his will. As we grow in our faith, it should cause us to lean more into his voice, hearing what he is saying, and then standing in faith and declaring his will in our situation. He wanted them to be at rest in him 
And I believe implied in here is he would have been happy for them to calm the storm. I mean, they'd already, they'd already been sent out. They'd already, they'd already done some amazing ministry by this point. But they hadn't, they hadn't gone beyond the basics to the place where they were hearing his voice, declaring his will in faith. Listen, as you and I are walking close to the Lord, God's going to speak to your heart. And that's the essence of his power flowing through your life. But in order for that to happen, you'll have to have enough faith to declare what he spoke to your heart, even when it seems impossible. But with the voice of God to your heart is the power of God to do what he has spoken, right? So when we think of God's power and his hand on us, we just need to be alone in his presence. I want to challenge you. Some of you have gotten away from a personal, private, devotional time with the Lord. You desperately need it. I'm not, listen, it's not a legalistic thing. It's not do this, or you're going to hell. Do this and you'll earn God's favor. That's not what I'm talking about. Do this and you'll hear his voice. Do this and his presence will come upon you in a greater way. Do this and you'll be able to, by faith, to declare his will in the midst of impossibilities that face the lives of people around you. And you'll be able to bring his kingdom power into those situations. It comes when we slow down and we sit at his feet. It comes when our spirit hears his voice. It comes when his plan becomes more important to us than our needs. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.